Hi, folks. Welcome back from uh, from lunch, and I hope you've enjoyed the uh, the morning session. Um, we got off the blistering start, and we're going to continue in that mode. Um, I'm just. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, this this next session, which is really starting to look at drill into uh, behavioural change. And to get us off, really, we've got Sophie Thomas. Sophie leads um, uh, Thomas Matthews, which is a, a, a kind of does that well, it's a design studio in London. And Sophie is an unusual mix of campaigner, practice and designer, chartered waste manager. She's been working in sustainable design um, and behavioural change really for the last 15 years. And she's going to be looking at the designer's response to the climate emergency. So Sophie, can I invite you up and take it away? Hi. So welcome, everyone. Great that you've had lunch. I haven't had my lunch yet, so I shall have it after this. But um, Yes, actually not 15 years, nearly 22 years I've been working in sustainability and um, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to talk to you about, from a designer's perspective, the response to climate emergency and actually the power of creativity. So how we can really use the kind of uh, the strength of the UK creative industry to really push this agenda and really get proper change happening, this paradigm shift that we're looking at. So a bit about me. Uh, my slides aren't moving, which is good. Oh, here we go. So hopefully you can see that. That's me. Um, I am uh, in my local habitat here, which is kind of <laughs> a pile of uh, plastic, flexible waste, mixed plastic um, in Athens. I think this was taken. But I am, as Ian was saying, I'm um, a designer. I'm also a chartered waste manager and I work a lot in system design and uh, material flows and material understanding and data crunching. Um, I have a business, so Thomas Matthews is the communication design side of it. We're part of uh, the Useful Simple Trust, which is actually an employee um, benefit trust. And there are, we are part of a different, uh, different businesses that work we work with. So we've got an engineering company, Expedition Engineering. We've got architects, education, sustainability consultants. So I cross over the communication design and the sustainability side of it. And we are very much a B Corp, uh, purpose-driven design for changing environments. So very much working, again, through the process of the built environment, but through the materials and through the design systems. Um, I ran... Uh, between 2012 and 16, I ran the Great Recovery Project, which was um, an investigat investigatory journey uh, to understand the impact of design on the life cycle of our stuff. And actually looking at the concept of circularity and circular design and the circular economy and how uh, this could potentially change the way that we think about things. And we took thousands of designers to different parts of the waste and material streams. So from end of life to material recovery facilities to incinerators, all the way to this area, which is actually a reuse um, facility down in Kingston and looked at the kind of way that our stuff is made and you know how we could make it better, think about reuse, think about all these different ideas that are kind of circulating around about moving away from this kind of one product, one use. Um, ethics that currently sits in our design process. So I've spent uh, years looking at this stuff. I've spent years looking at things uh, in macro and micro. Um, I tear stuff apart. I work with chemists and inventors. So here's me with Mike Pitts, who's a chemist and uh, the, who was, and also Mark Chamkins, who was an inventor at the Science Museum residency there. And here we are tearing apart a toothbrush a very, very simple product. So thinking about, you know, what happens, what do you think is in a toothbrush? And actually we found metal pins in our toothbrush. So this kind of like unexpected um, and peeling back the layers of how things are made and unmade to, to make sure that we can really understand the, all of this stuff. And I also track back through systems. So I look about where stuff goes and, and why, and I sort of think about it from an anthropolo anthropological perspective process of why we don't want things anymore and also for my sins I've done uh, bin training so this is the K7 crew in their split truck in Kensington and Chelsea so really kind of like getting a full experience full hands-on experience which is a very sort of kinesthetic way of learning like actually we talk about the theory of all of this stuff we talk about the theory of 
climate change. We talk about the theory of net uh, zero carbon, but actually, what does it really mean? And from a designer's perspective, we have huge amount of impact all the way along the chains of this of these products. So, what has this really got to do with? when we start talking about the climate emergency and the response that we can give as designers. And I'm just sort of um, sort of stepping back, right back a bit. And this is a book that my mum gave me. Um, she lent it to me. It's her Citizens Advice Notes uh, book, which was issued by the National Council of Social Services in 1942. And so this was the kind of book that all the ARP wardens had around the country. And it was the law on all the regulation and legislation around all different types of of um, important things that had to happen and, and laws at the time. So things like um, how do you black out your windows all the way to how do you get rid of a wardrobe that's broken, etc. So everything was in this. Um, and at this time, paper was very valuable resource because obviously we had all the, our um, imports of our raw materials being bombed um, by the U-boats in the channel and on the on route to, to our country. So anyone um, found wasting it was heavily fined. And this is a spread from the uh, sort of Ministry of Salvage section, which talks about the salvage of waste paper and the salvage of rags, ropes and string. And you can read here that actually uh, retailers were not allowed to use it for wrapping food stuff um, unless they needed it for transportation. Um, there was a gratuitous distribution of circulars relating to sales was specifically forbidden and actually this book doesn't even uh, refer to plastic although it does refer to one of its precursors which is gutta percha which you can sort of see on the very uh, right hand corner there and actually that again that was treated as a very very valuable resource so this is a very different position from where we are now where we we love stuff we define ourselves through our stuff around us you could say that the design industry is fueled by this statement here by Victor Papanak fantastic um, design observer. Um, so now we have these different calls for actions. We have these, uh, we have businesses around us uh, declaring climate emergency. We have other businesses saying they've got their route maps to net zero carbon by 2030. And these are the kind of clients that are coming to me now. So they're saying, you know, I've, I've done this, I've declared it, what do I do now? And um, it's not always about all of these things are not all about renewables and carbon capture. And this is really where designers come into the, the position here, into the picture. So in the uh, recent 2021 CREDS report, resource efficiency scenarios for the UK and the technical uh, report from EMF here, which is a, this is a snapshot from called Completing the Picture. We're reminded that of the energy that's required to transform raw materials into products. And of course, the majority of this energy is provided by fossil fuels and therefore massively contributes to climate change. And also we have to think about if we want to reduce this particular footprint you know, of, the, of this massive amount of carbon, if we want to go for net zero carbon, we have to start thinking about the materials that are in our products. And that's, um, as EMF says here, that's about 45% of our total current emissions. So it's a really, really big issue and a really big thing for uh, designers to get involved in. So um, it's not only about the materials that are embodied into our products. Um, we also know that we have these, we have developed these massive global assembly lines of our products for goods. And these are all driven by economies of scale. This is one of the laptops that we took apart at the Great Recovery. And so many different parts of these come from different parts of the planet different countries, different areas. And we actually did um, a source mapping exercise for a 300 pound laptop, which you're looking at here. Um, and this goes from digging out elements like coltan in the DRG to the delivery of the box product to, at the warehouse. And you can see that huge amounts of materials come from all the way around the planet. They're sub-assembled, parts are assembled at one place and they get shipped to another, and then they get pulled to another, so they get assembled again, all for a 300 pound laptop. And things like coltan is is a fascinating material because it's actually something that we're going to need a huge amount of. Uh, that cobalt is absolutely uh, crucial to the um, development of our renewable technologies of our um, electronic vehicle fleets, etc. And incidentally, we have no uh, 
percentage of recycled coltan happening at the moment. So all of that is a very, very linear process. And actually the materials that go into our products, what we call the eco rucksack of the product, is absolutely massive and very, very hidden from most consumers and most citizens. So if we look at this list, you know, you've got a toothbrush having at 1.5 kilos of raw materials going into it. So very, these products are very, very heavy with lots of different materials. And shockingly, 90% of all those products are waste within six months of purchase. So that's to do with the fact that we have this massive flow of disposable products running through our system. So some stats for that. There's 175 litres of water used in the manufacture, the full manufacturing um, life cycle of a half a litre bottle of, of Coke or of equivalent um, fizzy drinks. We have um, the average, the average uh, use wear of clothing is now seven times in the UK. And even the recycled clothing that are going into the markets in Africa um, aren't good enough quality to sell. So they're calling for better quality um, clothes from the, in the secondhand market. And there's been a 36% decline of use from clothing over the last 15 years. So we're getting less use out of our clothing as we used to. We now have a European critical element list where we have for a long time, but it's now at 30 elements on that list. And these are vital again, as I was saying before, for progress in renewables and tech but getting harder to mine, more expensive to refine with political environment, geological pressures, geographical pressures. These are like your, our rare earth elements. These are indium that we need for our PVs and for our iPhones, um, copper, high tech. And as I said before, indium uh, has no recycling uh, system at the moment. So very, very little, less than 0.1% of our global indium currently in use is being recycled. The same with rare earth, so it's only three to eight percent recycle cycle process so incredibly linear but incredibly critical to the way that we want to move our um, whole way of living into something that is more about renewables and um, less um, fossil fuel focused and we also have this other issues that have really come to light recently um, eight to twelve million tons of plastic entering the ocean each year possibly and very probably an under, underestimation. Plastic items from takeaway food and drinks dominate the litter in the world oceans and, and with just 10 plastic products making up to 75% of all items making their way into the ocean through the global globe's river systems. So really none of this should be happening. Um, and this is because our design focus is very much from product and we need to really shift it to a system. So waste is a material. Usually what happens is the material in the wrong place and often because we can't get it out. So why are we designing things that we are in that position where we're sticking things properly, we're, we're designing for manufacturer rather than uh, remanufacturing, unmanufacturing, taking apart. And again, why design? Why am I here talking to you guys? Well, because of this stat, when I start designing something, when I put pen to paper or I start, or I open up my design, um, process I'm at a point where actually at that concept stage I am locking in what is going to be have how that product is made what I'm specifying my materials and I'm thinking about the molding the gluing and the forming of all of this stuff and that's 80 percent is pre is locking down that environmental cost so it's a massive way of like thinking about that 80 percent as a very positive um, opportunity from going from something which is very much more from, from uh, a linear for raw material to waste through the system, um, all the way through to something which is much more circular. So this is one of the tools that we developed at the, at the Great Recovery, which looks at circularity on different levels. So four different design models. Are we designing for longevity? Therefore, your materials are stronger. Therefore, your relationship to your consumer is much more about the repair, repability. You have manuals online or is it about leasing and service where actually you can send something back they can upgrade it for you and you can get um, uh, a better or sort of um, an upgraded model of something is it about taking it back to the manufacturer getting them to take it apart and reusing parts within new models or is it about a very fast uh, material recovery where you're getting through things through the system back into products very very quickly so all of these different ways don't take 
an understanding of how those materials need to be in use for as long as possible, keeping the value up as long as possible so that we don't have to keep extracting new materials and building new products along the way. And the circular network. So when I talk about design teams, I'm talking about uh, who am I going to be working with? So often or not, designers generally work in the orange section, which is about manufacturers working with the brand companies and consumers. They may touch into the material experts, but I always have in my design teams, um, a system engineers at my side, they crunch the data for me, they debate hotspots of innovation, and I have a waste manager that I can ring up at the end of a line who can help me through, is this material recovered? You know, it says it's, it says it's recyclable, what does that mean? How can I get that material back? Is it degradable? Does it could get, am I adding too much contamination? All of these questions that actually allow me to get into the detail of how I'm designing our products, to think about the third and the fourth life of a product, rather than saying, this is recyclable. It's much deeper than that. It's talking about the kind of uh, focusing on the material life cycle rather than the product life cycle, which is very important. So design isn't a silver bullet, but it's definitely a key changer. And how you build the design team is really important. Um, and then thinking about designing from a whole system, a whole life perspective. You know, are we talking about the, to, to the right people? Are we innovation, innovating in the right places? And um, I wanted to take a bit of a focus on two different materials very quickly, um, to looking at, particularly looking at food and packaging, partly because um, it's an area which I know you might be focusing on, but also um, there's a lot of behavior change issues around this. Um, and I tend to start at the end and I work back and I find the problems and then I draw out the kind of end of life chains and look at the different material streams. So firstly, you know, I often, start on designers who work in circularities tend to start in excuse me where the leaks are in the system so this is kind of um, a map of different plastic recycle or plastic uh, flows of bottles whether it's milk bottles or pop bottles or water bottles etc and so we know that there's about 32 percent of the products and the, the material streams around the circle which actually get lost in the systems and we don't really know where those are and they often are spread across the whole of the um, area. Often in the way that we collect our waste so here is a fantastic bit of communications about the fact that um, everything can be chucked in this and don't worry about it and this is a large happy bin but what is the citizen's attitude towards this large open mouth bin which is generously inviting us to put everything in it we have massive contamination um, and we have a message on it, which actually I couldn't believe when I saw it. Because when I looked in the bin, I thought actually not 4% of that's going to be incinerate, incinerated. It's going to be more like 96% because there's so much contamination of food in there particularly. Um, not all material is equal and not all plastic has value. So in the Trust Greenpeace report, um, we know that the, at that time of their research, Turkey had about 40, was receiving 40% of our UK's plastic waste exports, but nearly half of that was mixed plastics. This is a good mix of plastics. This is actually full of plastic that can be used. And this is something like, say, Nick Cliff here would be very pleased to get. Um, this is the kind of stuff that they would be sending over to Turkey. Um, mixed plastic is very hard to recycle, so it has a very difficult second life, let alone third or fourth life. And um, But there are some good is a good case study of a product in here. So actually, when you talk to them, uh, plastic recycling guys, they really love their plastic to be given to us, given to them like this. So we've got very specific streams of different plastics. What they tend to get is this, and this is how we design it. You know, we get a PT bottle, so your kind of fizzy drink bottle will wrap it with another type of plastic. Then the machine can't read the plastic. You know, it gets all very complicated. So. What they want to do, and this particular story was actually about the milk bottle plastic, and when they get, which is an HDP, which is a kind of uh, a sort of milky coloured plastic. And so in the UK, we drink a lot of semi skim milk. Um, so you can see the green pieces in, within this. And it tends to give a green, it gave a green tinge to the uh, secondary, so the recycled plastic, which HDP, which actually could potentially become new bottles for milk bottles. So you can see here, there's a slight tinge to the bottle on the left-hand side, which has recycled content in it. Now to get round this, 
um, they wanted to do uh, what was called an R&D project, wrapped in it with um, the uh, Milk Marketing Board and got people around the table, designers included, to look at how they could actually reduce this hue because the Milk Marketing Board said, no, we don't want this because people will think the milk's off because it will have this nasty tinge. So actually that sort of perception of what materials, what secondary materials should look like, very pristine, very white, very pure, actually is not that achievable and isn't, it means that you have to add a whole other different layers of um, complexities to the processes. So what they did do, the quick win was actually changing how much ink went into the top of the milk bottle top. So the green tinge was actually tinted rather than lots and lots of dye and they reduced the dye by about 70% in order to get that back and everyone became happy. So that this kind of win around that was very good. It's a very sort of, uh, the milk bottle was seen as a poster boy for the plastics um, recycling process. But also if we think about how we set up separate bins. So these are bins that was next to each other at Latitude uh, Festival that I was working at. And actually what's happening here is you can just see, it's a bit like bingo, like who, where do you put your cup? You know, so you have this kind of um, materials which you think are recyclable and you think are good, like paper, but actually do they go in the recycling? Do they go in compost? And actually they've ended up in all the bins across here. So you've got massive map contamination, you've got huge confusion. Um, and we worked with um, Latitude and the festivals to actually work out what type of products they should be put, what type of drinks containers they should be putting their drinks in on the campus, on the site, or the festival, sorry. So whether it is like here, they started to ask us, well, should we be using um, biodegradable plastics? And actually, at the moment, we can't really deal with that here because we don't have the right kind of incineration or um, industrial composting to be able to take it. So what tends to happen is if you have a lot of PLA and you have a lot of biodegradable plastics in the waste system, then actually it will be, end up probably being incinerated. So dealing with things like this and thinking about it on a system level allows you to really understand what the kind of materials we should be designing with. Um, a very good example of this, and my sort of last case study is actually um, cups. So uh, these are disposable cups, um, this product. We get through about 5,000 a minute in the UK on a, well, sort of pre-COVID time. So it's a massive project. It's a very, very high spec design product. It has a double curve in it, so it has to take very, very hot coffee. Um, it's got an inner lining of plastic, as we know. But perception wise, it feels like paper. So you've got this massive confusion happening. And the, the cellulose fibers are very, very valuable, actually. So the process of like <coughs> recycling these products is, is complex. We have to uh, crush them. We have to separate out the plastic. Also goes with Tetra Pak. So you've got this extra layer of aluminium in this particular mix. Then you end up with this kind of mulch. We separate again. We do a kind of like um, a a water separation system and you end up with this kind of paper bulk which is this is actually very very valuable product but you can see that when people say well I can take this cup back to a recyclable recycled back into a beautiful white cup it doesn't always translate as that and this is really important for actually to really understand that actually a recycled and, a, and getting your materials back means that you have to reduce down the contamination that's the inks the the plastics the glues etc in order to get those materials back to something that is is as pure as possible. So within that work, a lot of the anthropological behavior change piece that we tend to do, and we talk to people and talk about the, um, the problems that they have when they do waste diaries, when they look at their kind of look into their bins, they kind of become, it was a fantastic comment. They say, you know, I'm completely material illiterate. I don't actually know what this material is anymore. Is it paper? Is it paper with a wax? Is it paper with a plastic? And actually that's very, very um, common to hear this. You know, we've become quite sophisticated as designers to in, imitate different materials, which is actually not helpful uh, to citizens. Also, you know, there was a great misconception about the milk bottle. You know, actually everything should be in cartons because cartons are de degradable, aren't they? And everything should be biodegradable and we should be avoiding plastic completely. Now, the issue is that that's the system we have. So we have to start, if we are going to shift our materials 
pallet into something else and take plastic out completely, which we do have a massive issue with plastic. You know, as we've talked about them, the amount of plastic in the system is extraordinary. We do have to think about different scales. So this is the today, tomorrow and future. So actually optimizing our systems now in order for us to, to be able to innovate later on and think about how we can really a um, get new materials into the market but get that whole system for capturing and getting it back into another material and really understanding it so we don't end up incinerating a huge amount of our waste so effectively it's not all black and white uh, this stuff is complex circularity is a very complex thing it's an economic system but actually what's super fascinating about it is there's a huge amount of um uh gain from it so you know the fact that we could if we had more adoption of circular economy business models in the uk there's a potential that rap says that we could get over 75 billion pounds into gross value added we could have save over 15 million tons of greenhouse gas reductions and we could have over 38 million tons of waste diverted from landfill so there's a huge amount of potential and it's just about getting designers and everybody, you know, it's like the whole of that whole chain together. So tools like this, very, very useful for us to use, you know, thinking about this is the kind of the standard double diamond design tool that we use on a lot of things, but actually really understanding where we want to be is the really important thing like and and understanding this kind of like this movement towards prototyping evaluating getting date getting the proper data out of um of our products getting the proper data out of our societal loop how much how long is that product going to be in uh, in use how long does that building want to stand up for how can i get those materials back can those bricks be reused again can that paper be made into something else all of these decisions all of these questions have to be challenged by the designer by the client by the citizen by the business by government and it's a whole piece coming together so that's a massive whistle stop tour of the designer's impact and response and um, I'm going to stop because I've run slightly over. That's fine. That's fine, Sophie. That is generated a massive discussion going on in the uh, discussion line. We probably don't get time for one question. And I think I'll take Paul Barnard, who wrote the first question, in, and which is essentially, uh, Paul works at the, the council. He's talking about how to better engage Plymouth businesses and residents in preparing their climate emergency uh, action. So how do you engage communities around uh, these, these issues? From a designer's perspective and from a, well, from a citizen's perspective, I think the um, the very important thing that we found about when we were designing the, well, looking at the kind of circular network was the, the real uh, influence and importance of uh, citizen and community voice and the fact that the pressure that comes from the, the fact that people just go, no, that's not good enough, you know, from a um, say if I'm designing a new product and I would do a kind of materials mass balance or um, life cycle analysis on this product, that doesn't necessarily take into account the citizen's perspective. So, for instance, if I'm looking at, say, a plastic bottle that could, um, you know, like for water, for instance, if I did a if I did a sort of life cycle analysis on that, it would actually come out as being the best product to use for that would be a PET, so a product that's actually already used in a plastic bottle. But then if I started to show that to customers, to citizens, and they would say, I don't want plastic. I don't want any more plastic. Don't show me any more plastic. It's really choking up our oceans. We have loads of it in our landfill sites. We have to incinerate it all. There's no recycling going on. You know, I don't want it. It's just rubbish. But that's not in our kind of um, calculations. So that, that uh, pressure from communities is, is so crucial to make sure that actually these products are the right the materials are the right materials to use and then it also it flips to like really understanding from an ethnological point of view what people do you know we have these as designers we have these big black holes in our um, kind of understanding of what happens in household systems you know how do we how can we make people um you know reuse take their reuse bags to the shops or to you know drive less or to cycle more you know what what is stopping people do that is it about the fact that you know for instance i hired a 
um, electric car the other day because we got rid of our car and we cycle everywhere because we're in London. It's really easy for us to do that. So we hired a car, but we couldn't then charge it anywhere because there weren't enough charging stations around and we weren't told how to charge the car properly. So it was actually really, really painful. But that's um, because the 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 system isn't set up properly yet and we haven't kind of got we haven't got that communication really really flowing properly well i, I think paul might be following up with you i suspect uh, anyway but the just a letter a couple of people there's going to be a discussion forum on this topic we're also now going to go into the parallel sessions there's a parallel session of behavioral change and nudge and things like that. So if you want more of the fix of this behavioral change then we can get it here i'm going to draw it to a close and thank you sophie hugely for showing that creative kind of forensic analysis of this has been fantastic thank you Brilliant.